Welcome to Season 7, Episode 3 of the Ubuntu Podcast. It's Wednesday the 16th of April and we're going to discuss what's been happening in the news and in the Ubuntu community. If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the hash UPC IRC channel on the Freenode network. I'm Mark and joining me this week are Alan. Hello. Tony. Hi. And Laura. Hiya. <laughs> you sound like you've got a mouthful of cake, Laura. <clears throat> No, not at all. No? Okay, okay. <laughs> Must be my imagination then. Uh, yeah, if you say so, if you say so. It's a, it's a nice cake. That it was, what's it called? Seminole cake? Simnel. Simnel. It's Easter cake. Simnel <laughs> cake. I don't know. I've never Sim- heard of this before. Simnel cake is the Seminole Easter cake. It seems that way. It's yeah. delicious. Let's avoid any more jokes yes. in that regard. Let's get on with the show. Okay. And now it's time for the news. And the first piece of news is quite somber. It mm. is oh. the death of Windows XP. Hey, and where's there the, was much rejoicing. Where's the fanfare music that I used to where, <laughs> where is the Creative Commons licensed music? Uh, well, it's kind of almost dead, given that the uh, British government have paid five and a half million to continue receiving support for another year. Uh, oh, money well spent then. Yes, yes. Uh, it's not like they had any warning that this was going to happen <laughs> at all. Hmm. Oh, I remember when it was born. Yeah. Yeah, yeah actually, I was yeah, f- using it for the first time on like one of my mate's PCs in his bedroom. Be about 12 years old now. <laughs> what, Mark? <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or his, or his friend. No. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I actually, it came out the week we moved into our house. Oh wow! And um, I remember having a pirated copy on a desktop <gasps> PC. We and, don't endorse that. Uh, no, I uh, can't I'm, it I'm even. just saying. And uh, I remember my dad being uh, quite impressed by it. I think. And actually, I remember getting up the next day after that party and getting really angry because <laughs> someone had spilt beer all over my keyboard. And I, and I sent an email around to all my friends and was like, which one of you spilt beer all over my keyboard? And they were like, Alan, mate, it was you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing about those keyboards is you could just put them in the dishwasher and bring That's them out right. and dry them out. The old clackety clack ones. Buckling so, spring technology. So what are people going to uh, upgrade to then? If, uh, if XP well, is... you can't buy Windows 7 anymore, can you? Um, yeah. So uh, presumably the upgrade path is Windows 8. Yeah. Yeah, but you, I mean, a machine that's running XP is potentially going to be something of the order of 10 years old, maybe slightly yeah. less. Yep. It's not going to run Windows 7 either. No. I mean, no. some people might throw as much RAM at, they, at it as they can, or they'll just throw it away and decide that's the point at which time they move on to something else, which will be a new laptop or might be a tablet or... Uh, or some people optimistically hope Linux. Mm. Yeah. Do you think Linux is going to get a big boost out of the death of XP? No. Oh, don't be so pessimistic. No. Why well, not? I was being really Ubuntu is not going to run on it, is it? If it's not, if yeah. it won't run. Well, and, Windows and, and 7. Ubuntu flavor would run on. on I think, um, yeah, XP there are machines. there are some lightweight distros that yeah. would run on a Windows XP era Zubuntu. machine. Exactly. Um, yeah, things like Crunchbang or Lubuntu or Ubuntu mm. or something like that. Or just a um, shell. But I don't. <laughs> and then no apps. No. But I think it's more than that, though, because people move, migrating off XP are not just. It's not just the OS. They've got you know years and years, possibly ten or more years invested in that computer. So there might be lots of photos and videos and all their documents and stuff. So it's not just a case of throwing it away and getting something else. Yeah, they've they've got yeah. to work out this migration, and I think a lot of people will just stay with yeah, it I... until their hard disk dies, yeah. and then they say, "Oh no, I've lost everything anyway. I might as well buy a new computer." Yeah, I reckon it'll be less households and more people like doctors and dentists. Well, the thing the thing that oh, yeah. the, that I wonder about the whole the whole British government getting support thing is. Windows XP is the last version to still have support for IE6. Um, we know mm. that there's been, you know, lots of apps like in- intranet type systems right. which have yeah. been built for IE6 with lots of ActiveX stuff, which took a long time to get migrated off of, if ever. So I'm wondering if some of the reason that they need support for it is because they're still running stuff on IE6, which is terrifying. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> it could just be the hardware thing, of course. Yeah, you know, they've got lots of old hardware kicking around on desktops and stuff that mm-hmm. hasn't been replaced, can't afford to be replaced at such short notice of, yes, you know, of three course. or four years. And I don't yeah. think households keep them that long. 
Um, I think they replace them when they break, on. even if it's just software, they'll I replace the hardware as I well. I think it depends. I mean, you know, young families often, you know, the kids will have newer mobile devices. But, mm. um, yeah, I know, I know a fair few people who've got, um, you know, a PC in a bedroom somewhere and it's, you know, it gets turned on every so often and, and it's got XP on it and it runs okay. Mm. Well, fair enough. Well, good luck to everybody who's trying to shuffle their way off the mortal coil of XP. Mm. Um, you might have heard in the news there's been a slight security issue. Um, what? Regarding the OpenSSL software being dubbed Heartbleed, um, but it's a sort of, you know, fairly nasty bug that risks exposing everything um, over... What uh, exactly is the problem then? What exactly is the problem? <laughs> the problem Come on, Tony. Your electrifying personality there, Alan. You're, um, basically, uh, it's a... Uh, non uh, string length thing basically the client uh-huh. can ask tell me more <laughs> very well explained you know we do those job. things where i i try to explain stuff and i don't really understand it and i yet i try to make out i do no this isn't one of those uh, um, okay for comedy is it, is purposes it definitely not because no. you used to work as a sysadmin didn't you so you know this sort of thing <laughs> yeah, i'm not a developer though but basically would you like me to explain it tony the client no mark's cli- gonna, mark's gonna come to the rescue now uh, the client can ask for um, more characters back than it should do, and therefore, the com- and the server will send those characters back even if they are not the characters <laughs> they're supposed to be. It might include sensitive personal information that's or security ba- information. That's basically the XKCD explanation, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but with fewer drawings. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Mark, I mean, have you got anything you want to add to that? Um, no, yeah, well, that's pretty the, comprehensive, yeah, it, really. Yeah. That's a Bruce Schneier kind of uh, <laughs> level there, of there expertise was, there. There. Was, there was a feature added to OpenSSL called Heartbeat, where basically you could say to the server, like basically tell, tell me that you're still there mm. by saying here's a message and it's this long and send it back. And then if you said here's a message and it's actually it's this long, but that wasn't the length it actually was, then it would still, as you say, send some characters. But that, those characters would be essentially whatever OpenSSL last had in memory, which is likely to be something which was encrypted, like, you know, sensitive data, personal documents, passwords, passwords right. um, or really boring encryption stuff. keys, that sort of thing. All really boring stuff, yeah but a potentially not really boring stuff to someone right. malicious. And this was introduced in a, quite a relatively recent version of OpenSSL. Two years ago. Re- yeah, two years yeah. ago, but, but which by server standards is, you know, I mean, if, for instance, if you're running a stable CentOS or Debian or Red Hat server, mm. then it won't have it because they wouldn't have updated to that version of OpenSSL. But if you're running a um, an Ubuntu server or something which has tends to have more recent packages, then you will have it. Yeah, mm-hmm. so the moral of the story is don't run a Bunty server. <laughs> it's massively insecure. Um, okay. Or run a really old one. Yeah, I mean, my Debian VPS, my Bitfolk VPS, um, wasn't vulnerable. If you're still running 10.04, yeah, you're probably fine. Yeah. Right. Yes, anyway, so it's a massive thing. Um, lots of sites have been vulnerable to attack using this uh, route, so lots of people are recommending changing passwords and things. Um it's only worth doing that once the sites concerned have been patched, otherwise you can just get compromised again. Um, sites like Mumsnet were uh, believed to have been compromised to a degree with the uh, the heart bleed. Yeah, I'm not sure how they, they think they, they were um, compromised. Well, this yeah. is the thing, because they, these people have come out saying, oh, we think we've been compromised, but part of the part of the the reason this bug is so nasty is it doesn't leave any trace. Yes. So You, you uh, don't know that your details yeah. have or haven't got sp- uh, split. Right. Spilt. Alan's buzzing a little bit. We might have to have a look at this. Um, okay, so, yeah, basically, uh, you know, check your stuff, check your sites, check your security updates, um, or run old versions of software. <laughs> like XP. <laughs> like when yeah, like XP. XP. Was XP uh, vulnerable oh, to it or not? I, I dread to think. Mm, okay. Laura, what's up next on the news? Yes. Um, so the Up and Rights Group has launched an Indiegogo campaign to raise money for a campaign video against internet censorship in the UK. Um, if you go for the top perk, you get your name mentioned in the video. Yay! And and I think that's already gone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not really sure why they did it as an Indiegogo campaign because it doesn't... I mean, looking at the rewards for contributing to it, none of them make me think, oh, yeah, really, really good thing to contribute towards. Yeah. So why didn't they just do it as an open rights group campaign on their website? Also, I, I was reading the thing, the, the blurb about it, and it seemed as if they'd already made the video... But they needed the money for the campaign, and what would have been useful is an explanation of what campaign costs mm. are, because most people don't know unless they work for a charity or something. I'd have thought. Yeah, it does seem it does seem like a, a bit of an odd way of going about it, and yeah, like the 
as I say, the top perk is, you know, having your name mentioned in the video for £750. Which somebody's paid. Which someone's paid, so they obviously thought it was worth it. But Really? Yeah. yeah. You can put a video up on YouTube with your name in it for I a know. <laughs> or, you know, you get to the, the £10, which is the basic level, is you get to see the video one day before it's publicly released. Well, there's a sound investment. Yeah. But anyway, I, I mean, it's... It's, it's halfway it's, there. As much as I'm as much as I'm talking this down, it is a really worthwhile worthwhile campaign. I think I just mm. don't think it's a very good choice for Indiegogo. But yeah, it's it's basically about highlighting the issues around in- internet censorship and compulsory filtering, which the government are trying to um, are trying to mandate that ISPs bring in and right. trying to guilt parents into doing it because otherwise their children won't be safe or something. Yeah, yes. and it's a humorous I, I, video trying to make the points to parents. I, think, I got it? the same feeling for, from the the pitch that Jim was giving. It felt like they'd done it already. Yeah, and this was just marketing. Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought we fixed Alan, but he's broken again. I don't know. I think it's the cat having <laughs> eaten my microphone. That's what it is. It could be <laughs> not the podcast. You know what? After seven years of doing this podcast, we finally found a way of shutting <laughs> him up. <laughs> But anyway, so who's next? Uh, I'm Mark, in fact. Um, An independent audit of the TrueCrypt disk encryption system has concluded and it has found that there is no evidence of intentional flaws in the technology or backdoors put in by people like the NSA and GCHQ. But a few possible mistakes, but that was yeah. all fine. Yeah, so there's there's some things like the, the, the quality of the code in some places isn't as good as it could be and there's odd bugs here and there which right um you know which could possibly compromise it a bit until they're fixed but it doesn't look like they've been put in there on purpose by someone and that's what they said about open ssl <laughs> <laughs> who, who did the audit um it was an independent security company who also audited some other things who which i didn't write down but like fairly high profile like some microsoft products and some other stuff they also don't know who they're working for because the TrueCrypt developers are, are anonymous. Oh, yes. Or like oh, to keep right. themselves anonymous. What, anonymous with a capital A? No, or no. Uh, anonymous with a little A. I Although organized. there could well be an overlap between the two. <laughs> yeah. We don't know. We just because don't know because they're, they're anonymous. anonymous. Yes. Yay. But yeah, TrueCrypt True is, is, the, the, is a clever encryption system because it lets you do the, the, a plausible, plausibly deniable encryption system where you can have an encrypted volume within what looks like blank space because the blank space is also encrypted so you could go to let's say you go through customs and the um tsa or the british police mm. under the law can ask you for your passwords yeah, right? oh, yeah. And you give them your password knowing that there is an encrypted volume on there yeah and you give them the password to the encrypted volume there could well be further encrypted data inside yeah. that that you don't tell them about they can't find it because it's, yeah, it's, it looks it looks it exactly looks the same like as blank space, so they have no way of proving that it that if you entered a different yeah. encryption key, then actually it decrypts all the stuff which you didn't want them to see. Yeah, so give them one key that lets them see all the kitten pictures, <laughs> and a completely separate key that has all your passwords and other stuff in it. I think they'll catch on pretty quickly if lots of suspicious people start producing <laughs> drives of kitten pictures. They can't prove otherwise. <laughs> Allegedly, that's the beauty of kittens. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, moving on, uh, Boy Genius Report have uh, got a post about the Samsung Galaxy S5S fingerprint scanner having been hacked. Right. So is this, this is where you use a sausage to uh, break in? No, they... <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Uh, it's, uh, you know how... Um, I think there's various technologies of fingerprint scanners. Some of them you just hold your finger over and some of them you have to swipe your finger and different, but, yeah. some technologies Stroke are more susceptible. Gently. Exactly. More susceptible They're basically the all others. taking a picture of your finger and trying to decide whether it's actually a finger or not. Right. And they've discovered that actually it's not as secure yes. on this particular model of phone um, as it is on other phones. Is it a software well, problem they, or a hardware problem? I don't think... They, they found that there, there's... The, yeah, the, the way that it's implemented is makes it somehow somewhat less secure than than other phones but the actual scanner you can fool it in the same way as you can with other scanners so it's not the it's not the fingerprint right. recognition stuff that's that's less secure it's just the fact that things like once you reboot the phone you can unlock it without entering a password just using the fake thumb or whatever right which with an iphone you have to when you boot it you have to enter a password the first time and then you can just use your thumb oh i see Right. Yes. Mm. But then, yeah, didn't Mythbusters do this in like 2006? 
Yeah, what, with, with a sausage thick thumbs? or with sellotape. Something. I've, I've seen, yeah. I've seen sellotape various. and a sausage. <laughs> I would have hoped the technology would move on from something debunked by Mythbusters in the past. But apparently yeah. it hasn't. Or or something that's been debunked by, like, James Bond. And mm. <laughs> well, the, the, myth, the Mythbusters, debunked, episode, the Mythbusters episode was, you know, oh. is all this stuff in films about how you can do it by, yeah. you know, copying a thumbprint actually true, and it is true. So... <laughs> But you have to remember that it's a bit of an arms race and sausage technology has also moved on <laughs> quite a lot in the last few years. Moving on. Um, the Guardian and Washington Post newspapers have been awarded the Pulitzer Prize for public service for their reporting of the NSA revelations. This is the Edward Snowden um, hacking allegations. Yeah, the, um, there was a, a tense moment this week when uh, Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poit- Poitras, I think mm. is her filmmaker, mm. is the filmmaker, that uh, they were flying from... Uh, Germany to America to go to an awards ceremony. I don't think it was said that it was this award ceremony. It was another one. Um, and uh, it seemed everyone had their eyes on uh, various flight tracking websites to see when the flight would land in New York because they didn't know if Glenn Greenwald and uh, Laura would be picked up by the TSA or picked up by oh, right. the American Secret Service for Having revealing what they right, had. Right, yes, um, sort of crimes against the it state. It seems they weren't accosted at the airport and they were allowed to pass through and then, you know, receive this rather amazing reward. Mm. Mm. Fair enough, excellent. Well, um, that looks like all the, all the news that we have time for right now, so we will uh, do something else instead. <laughs> for some community news. Huzzah. Aha. Uh-huh. Um, so the Gnome Foundation's facing a budget shortfall as payments to the Gnome Outreach Programme for Women aren't being met. As payments aren't being met with regular payments from donors and sponsors. So basically, the money that they were supposed to get or were hoping to get hasn't come in in time. And they've been, had, I think they've been oversubscribed or it's been a really popular right. programme. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, basically. Right. So if, the, if you've ever thought about um, like giving them some money in the past but never got around to it. They said, now would be a good time. <laughs> yeah, it'd be really helpful. Really. So there was a big brouhaha on, uh, on t- interwebs where people were complaining, oh, well, this just shows that they shouldn't be spending money on, on women. You know, women <laughs> those women bleeding the Gnome Foundation. Drive. Yeah, it wouldn't be in this place without women. <laughs> yeah, which is clearly not the case. <laughs> Uh, it's yeah, it's partly a cash flow issue and partly the fact that it was a success, a successful campaign. Yeah. Program. Yeah. So yeah, they do seem to have had a bit of a whip round from people to in order to try and solve some of this this problem. Right. Um, and they think they're all right for the next two or three months now, um, but you know nobody send them any nasty invoices. Yeah, and they just they said they're just cutting all the costs for the rest of the year to try no and get more back women. On. We've yeah. got enough women. No, enough Is women. That what you're saying? Yeah. We've got basically. all the women we can afford. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's Mark. And cats. <laughs> that was, yes. yeah. and cats. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. No more cat sponsorship. It's interesting. I guess the Gnome Foundation is mostly run by volunteers, and and mm. you know these finances are probably not the most closely looked at things in the world. And that was the problem. <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. That's unfortunate. They just uh, it's, there was something that was complex, or just wasn't kept an eye on, and it all just took them ages then to work it out, and then they got the bad news. Mm. Mm, excellent. Ubuntu 14.04 LTS is released tomorrow or Yay. today if you're listening to the download or on the day week. of release. <laughs> or, you know, yeah, last it's week, already happened if, you... if you're listening to it any later than that. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk more about that on the next show, I think. Which will be after it's been released. Yes. Well, unless you're listening live, in which case it will be Before. in about half an hour. <laughs> wow, we should get rid of these caveats. It's really, it's really not worth it. That's half past eight if you're in the UK. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll talk about that next time. Yeah. Uh, Marcus Costales has published an interview with the IT manager of a Spanish school about migrating the school's computers from Windows XP to Ubuntu 14.04. Topical? Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good interview. Like he's talking through all the sort of you know, the various reasons for it, what they're upgrading from. So there's mostly Windows XP and then a few of the, like, the teachers and the senior management had newer computers, so they've got Windows 7 or Windows 8. Um, and then he's talking a bit about the software they're running and how most of it is just, you know, they, they'll move from Photoshop to the GIMP and they'll move from Microsoft Office to LibreOffice, but then the textbooks all have their digital resources 
in um, as Windows programs. So he's mm. been contacting them and saying, look, you either need to make it so these that we can use these on Linux or we're going to have to find another textbook provider. It's cheaper to do that, presumably, than yeah, licensing than keep on paying Photoshop for, yeah. or Office. So it was about 100 computers and the migration took two months. And uh, one of the questions he asked was, how much is it going to cost you? And he said, well, we're not paying for official support, although that might be a good option. The real cost is zero as we're doing it ourselves. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. That's rather cool. Yeah. I think it's an argument whether you can say the real cost of that is. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, it depends how valuable your time is. Yes. And yeah. what you're not doing while you're doing that. But yeah. And if, if what you're not doing is not administering Windows XP, that's fine. And also <laughs> not upgrade. Well, the, not upgrading, yeah, the other yeah. thing you'd be doing is upgrading from Windows XP to Windows 7 and paying, oh, sorry, to Windows 8 and paying the licensing costs for that. So he's got mm. to upgrade to something, so so his time will be spent upgrading. It's whether yeah. he's upgrading to something which costs money or something which doesn't. True, good point, good point. Okay, so updated Ubuntu cloud images have been released on various cloud providers in response to the OpenSSL Heartbleed bug. You'll remember the uh, incisive commentary we gave on that earlier in the news, <laughs> the news segment. Um, but basically, yep, so the images that you get by default if you're deploying virtual machines into the Ubuntu cloud are now fully patched up to date and uh, secure against this particular vulnerability. Well, that's good news. Yes. Isn't it? Isn't it wonderful where you can just do these things, respin it, and, you know, off you go again. Mm. Don't leak your data all over the internet. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? Yes, Tony. Oh, my, my Debian VPS. Did I mention that, that that wasn't vulnerable? Your Debian VPS was old and crusty and wasn't vulnerable. Is that what you um, said? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes, you did mention that. Good. Just want to make sure that I got that right. Laura, what's up next? Colin Watson um, has blogged about the pain of porting GHC, the Glasgow Haskell compiler, to new architectures. Yeah, Can someone that explain sounds this? exciting. Well, you know, it's well, one of those things that someone has to do. And I found it really interesting to read it's not like super deeply technical mm. it's more about you know how he um you know the interaction with various people to get the get the get the work done and um how he had to keep coming back to it over a period of time because there were some things that were you know felt insurmountable at the time and were frustrating him so he had to go away and go. It was, it's like the story of over a, a few months so that this isn't doubting it but what's the point of it and what's well, it for Haskell or no, the GH, new architecture. Well, any of it. So the, so your laptop is x86. Yes. Right, and so often developers will uh, target x86. They'll they'll build on their local machine and it will work, right? Mm -hmm. And then along comes someone who makes a laptop that doesn't have an Intel chip in it, like Chromium, mm -hmm. uh, Google with the, the Chrome, Chrome, Chrome OS running. You've uh, been branded. Thingies. <laughs> yeah, those things, um, and you might want to run the software from that developer on this laptop, which is a different architecture. And it might well be that because the developer has never tried running it on an ARM-based mm. machine, it's never been ported, it's never been compiled. And then when someone tries to compile it, it actually doesn't even compile. So you can't even use it because it doesn't compile. Now, what, what Colin's blog post is about is the fact that um, uh, we're bringing Ubuntu 1404 to the IBM Power uh, architecture. Yay! And yes, yay! Uh, <laughs> but... Um, a lot of uh, apps in the archive have never been ported to PowerPC. They've never been run on it. Right. And right. as a result, they don't compile uh, for whatever reason. Um, some of them are you know, wacky, uh, wacky, bizarre, esoteric errors. And some of them are um, assumptions made by the original developers based on the architecture that they're currently sat mm. on or yeah. configuration options they've set wrong or memory space or some, you know. Anyway, Colin had this task to do and... Um, yeah, it's quite an interesting read about how he went about it. Yeah. Given that I think he, he said he's never written any Haskell code. He doesn't really know yeah, Haskell at all. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he's porting the compiler from uh, from one platform to another. That sounds mm -hmm. quite cool. Well, as Haskell users, are we uh, very pleased and thankful for Colin's work? Well, do you remember we interviewed uh, a couple of guys uh, who'd written a game called Nicky and the Robots? Yes. Yes. That was yeah. written in Haskell. Oh, really? Yes. yes. Ah, oh, uh -huh. oh yeah. it's useful for something then. I thought so that was written in Vala. For you some could reason. you could get your uh, IBM Power architecture uh, server <laughs> <laughs> and build Nikki and the robots to run on it. Brilliant. Maybe not. Mm. <laughs> um, and finally, in this week's community news, Robert Ansel has kicked off a discussion on the Ubuntu desktop mailing list about convergence plans for fourteen ten and beyond. Yes, convergence. Yeah. That sounds buzzwordy. Yeah, 
it's that that thing with uh, where you get a Windows app and it runs on your PC as well as your Windows phone. <laughs> yeah, it could be. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, with um, fourteen oh four almost out the door uh, as we speak. Yes, uh, I think he wanted to you know start the discussion about how we some of the tasks that we need to look at between now and fourteen ten and so and beyond. The plan for fourteen ten is going to be no more X. And no more Unity 7 no. and Convergence. Well, uh, not really. I think the target is 16.04 will right. be the fully converged, right. all LTS. of that done. Which steps we do in between, in the two years between now and 16.04, mm-hmm. you know, that's the bit we've got to plan out and figure right. out if, you know, if it makes sense for us to go crazy and switch now or whether we need to you know get device drivers done or apps ported or other infrastructure stuff or you know wait until we've moved across to system d or you know all these kind of other things we've got to kind of time them all right so they don't all land at the same time and end up with a completely broken release Mm -hmm. you know Mm. the one just after an lts that commonly gets a reputation (laughs) (laughs) for being the uh (laughs) the the cowboy release um you know uh, possibly uh unwarranted but you know it has that (laughs) reputation um, oh yeah, we need to plan those things out. And he brought up a number of things that that um, we need to think about, and uh, a couple of them that uh, obviously I'm slightly interested in because uh, they what come from be? a mobile. <laughs> well, he's talked a bit about the uh, Ubuntu system settings, which is uh, the settings app that we have on the phone, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and bringing that so it works on the desktop because there are things you have that you configure on the desktop that you don't have on a phone. So we need to make those things configurable, like multi-screen stuff. That, that we don't have on the phone. We don't but have settings for that. Because, but we will yes, want, yes. Right. Mm. And things um, like core apps as well. So things yeah, like calculator. Yeah, that was the other thing, and... talking about the core apps, because we're moving towards a, a QML-based shell, Unity 8, whether it arrives in as default in 14.10 or beyond. Yeah. Um, we need to target um, a set of apps that we can deliver with a default install. And whether the apps that we have on the phone are going to be those apps, or whether we need to bring up a bunch of other apps, or bring in apps from outside, port things or write things from scratch. You know, those are conversations we need to have between now and 1604, which is that target for full convergence. So can, when the the Unity 8 shell is running QML, can you not still run non-QML apps or have QML apps by default, non-QML apps by default rather? Well, it's kind of the same the same issue that you have now, where you know if you run GTK apps under KDE or KDE apps under GTK, yeah, you know they they kind of look out of place. They don't have the same theme. They don't have the same widget set. Right. Know. Okay. So I think the target is that by sixteen oh four we have fully converged um, apps. Can't that you just use integrated. all the KDE apps from Kubuntu? Uh, we may <laughs> well, we could well bring in you know some of the KDE apps. I, I'm not sure we'd mm. want all of them, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, certainly some of them could. Uh, over. But yeah, it's it's an interesting start to the discussion, and you know, it it's it's fun that at this time in the cycle, just as we're releasing, we you know you think there's going to be some rest because yeah. just put the release out, but it's now right full That's steam ahead for, for the you. next one. Yeah, it's, yeah, that one's done. Right, moving on. <laughs> there is no rest. There is no respite. The Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that entertains, engages, or enrages you, tweet at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook, and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. Please do get in touch. I mean it. Just one message. Just to know there's someone out there who cares. And that's all for not episode one, as it says on my piece of paper, but in fact, episode three of the seventh season of the Ubuntu podcast. Oh, well done. We'll be back next week with our thoughts on Ubuntu 1404. Yes. And some more quality chat. (laughs) Command line love, I think. Oh, command line love, even better. So many things. More cake. More cake. I think you've had enough. Right. Really? Tea might might go down well. Tea would be good. Let's get the kettle on. (laughs) Bye-bye. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.